the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings beyond his beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when we first talked about this, I didn't realize how big of a thing that I wanted to do because I thought, hey, let's just talk about the mothers and the believers. That's a really, really, really tall order for like about an hour and a half. So if there's a point where I'm like, I don't know, just, it's a tall order, but bismillah. So we're going to start. And then because besides that being a tall order, I thought it would be actually pretty cool if we started with the mothers of the greatest believer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because a lot of your personal relationships in terms of your marriage are actually very much dictated by what you saw your parents do. SubhanAllah. And the, what you grow up seeing in terms of, so, I don't know, for, for me, who my father was and the example that he gave me is what my expectation of what a man should be. And the same for men. When you see your mother and how she's acting, that's your expectation of what a woman should be. SubhanAllah. So I thought it'd be really cool to start with the mothers of the Prophet Sallallahu So the Prophet Sallallahu mom, there's, it's really interesting because his father actually passed away before he was born. But it's a, and I don't want to talk too much about his father because we're focusing on the moms. But the way that his parents got married is that his father was, he gets a new lease on life. So he was supposed to be sacrificed and it is a similar story to his great, great grandfather Ismail Alayhi Salam. Ismail, the son of Abraham, peace be upon him. He was supposed to be sacrificed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. So the father of the Prophet ﷺ had a similar experience where he was supposed to be sacrificed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. So the Prophet ﷺ is actually known as the son of the behind the two that should have been sacrificed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them. So his father gets a new lease on life. Everybody is really, really excited. And the first thing he does, he goes and he marries the mother of the Prophet ﷺ, Amina radiallahu anha. Which I think is really beautiful. Like there, there isn't a greater... We, the romantic gesture then you are if I have if I now have more time to live what I want to do is marry this person subhanallah so he marries the mother of the Prophet sallallahu and he leaves shortly after they get married he leaves on a business trip and he passes away on the business trip and he never actually gets to find out that his wife was pregnant or that he that he had a son at all subhanallah so he leaves but his mother Amina so she's at this point she's a young pregnant widow that is heartbroken at the loss of her husband. And all this stuff is happening in the year the Prophet ﷺ is born and is also known as the year of the elephant. And it's known as the year of the elephant because there was an army of elephants coming to destroy the Kaaba. So there was a man by the name of Abraha in, in, in Yemen and he really didn't appreciate the competition the Kaaba created for his big cathedral that he built. He's like, why can't I make religious money? Why can't people come in a pilgrimage to my cathedral that I built? So he decided the only way to fix it is to kill the competition by destroying the Kaaba. Terrible plan, but Abraha thought this way. He was actually a terrible human being. Anyways, he takes an army of elephants, he's marching towards Mecca, and there's a miracle that happens where there are birds that come out of the sky and they, they, they throw rocks, these burning hot coal rocks, at the army of elephants and the army of elephants turns back. But before that happens, like they're seeing the army, you can imagine everyone in Mecca is seeing this army of elephants coming to destroy their homeland. They've never seen an army like this in their lives. The people of Mecca are evacuating. If there's an impending war, the civilians evacuate. So the civilians evacuated, they went up to the mountains and they're watching the army of elephants approaching. And, Allah, and they also watch Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turn the army back. But you can imagine the mother of the Prophet ﷺ being a pregnant widow watching this army and processing her own grief, anha, subhanAllah. There are narrations where the Prophet ﷺ says that there were specific rocks and trees that would say salams to him. When he was young, he would walk around and there's trees and rocks that would say assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. And he would think, he would actually never told anyone until much later, until he actually became a prophet, because he was worried people would think he was crazy, or like, what, the rocks and trees are talking to you? But there's actually narrations that those same rocks and trees would give salams to his mom. And they would say assalamu alaikum ya ummi Rasulullah. Peace and blessings be to you, O mother of the Prophet So there's clearly his biological mother, radiallahu anha. There's another woman by the name of Umm Ayman. Her actual name means is Barakah. And Barakah means blessings. And subhanAllah, she was an Ethiopian woman that the Prophet actually inherited from his father before he was even born. And it was clear how deeply ingrained slavery was in the Arab society before Islam. And subhanAllah, Umm Ayman is the most consistent motherly figure in his life, sallallahu alayhi wa So she's there when he's born, she helps him with 
she's like the Prophet is born is just his mother and his nanny and his grandfather is overseeing him. There's a point short not too long after he's born that he goes out to them as was the tradition of the Arabs, they would go out to the middle of the desert and they would send their children there so that they could be raised there. I just moved to New York. No one should ever raise a child in New York. There's a reason why people raise their children where there's big open spaces. You have a lot less disease, you have a lot you have space to run around. Like children should are just can't be confined to spaces. So this is something that the Arabs would do. They would send their children out and with these nannies, especially when they were newborns. They'd have these wet nurses that would nurse them. They would teach them the Arabic and they would protect them from the disease and the hustle and the bustle of the city. So there was Halima radiallahu anha, and she's another one of the people that the other mothers in the life of the Prophet. I think it's really beautiful because when we it makes sense for his mother to love him. But for both Barakah or Um Ayman and Halima radiallahu anha, for both of them to say that we loved him as much as we loved our own children, that's a testament to both those two women and a testament to the Prophet himself. And I think it's just so beautiful. In what world does your nanny, where it's her job to make sure that you're okay, we don't say this out of respect for who these people are. But technically, he was her job. But yet she said she loved him just as much as she loved her own children, subhanAllah. And you can see how protective they were over the Prophet ﷺ even as a child. The Prophet ﷺ, when he leaves Halima, it's funny because he has um, so he has a brother that's his age from Halima, and, and a brother, Halima's son, so he's not his biological brother. And Halima has a daughter that's older than him. Years and years later, when the Prophet ﷺ conquers Mecca, Halima's oldest daughter, she tells her friend, she's like, you know, my brother's a king. No, he's not. And then she's like, no, 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 he is. And she takes him to Mecca and she goes and gives salams to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ is like, oh yeah, he takes off his abba, he puts it down, he has her sit. And this leader, this king, this leader is like honoring his sister, his older sister that would like watch him play as a child. And she goes to her friend, she's like, see, I told you he was a king. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Even though the Prophet ﷺ was an orphan that didn't have biological brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him so many people in his life. Really, and just gave him endless amounts of love, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from so many different people. After he leaves the care of Halima, radiallahu anha, he goes back to his mother. And he's living with his mother. And his mother, one of the first things she does, she takes him to Medina to visit the, the grave of his father. Because she wants to tell him of the stories of his father. And we talk about, we, we all have these images of the perfect family. You, hope, you have, you, I don't know. You live in a house and you have 2.2 children and you have a minivan and you have a garage and like we have a very textbook definition of what a perfect family is supposed to look like. The Prophet ﷺ was raised by a single mother. And in that space she's saying, I want you to know your father because it wasn't a lack of love. It wasn't a lack of love that you didn't have a father that was present in your life. And he had a grandfather and he had uncles and he had so many people in his life that were trying to compensate him for the love that he, the love his father would have otherwise given him. So she takes him on this trip, and he visits his father's grave, and he plays with the children in Medina. Years later, when he comes back, he says, yeah, yeah, I went swimming with the kids here. I played here. I did this here. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they leave the trip, and on the way back, his mother gets sick. His mother, Amina, gets sick. And it's just him and Amina and Um Ayman, and his mother is on his deathbed, and the six-year-old child is holding on to his mother, saying, don't leave me. And you can imagine the pain that he's going through, having visited his father's grave, now watching his mother pass away in the middle of nowhere. This place called Abwa is actually outside of Medina. If anyone goes to visit, it's just, there's still nothing there. It's far out enough from civilization that there's just nothing there. When she passes away, and Um Ayman, anha, she is the one that actually digs the grave. She buries Amina, and she takes the Prophet ﷺ back to Medina. Back, sorry, back to Mecca. And he's raised by his grandfather. He lives in his grandfather's home for two years. And then he's taken in by his uncle after his grandfather passes away. The Prophet ﷺ kept switching one house to another. Because people kept passing away. When he was 12 years old, his, his uncle was going on the same trip that literally took his father and took his mother. So he's going out to trade and he tells his uncle, he's like, don't leave me. Everyone I love leaves me. And he holds on to the Prophet ﷺ. he holds on to his uncle and he's just terrified. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you can feel the pain that he's going through. 
His uncle ends up, he goes on the trip, he's very protective of him. And his uncle, before the Prophet I sent him, besides the Prophet I sent him, he actually had 10 of his own kids. So now as the Prophet I sent him is growing older, he's not thinking, let me build my own family. He's thinking, how do I support the family that took me in? So he's going, he's just, subhanAllah. The Prophet I sent him had a very, very difficult life. And the reason I feel like that's important backdrop to the women that he married, you can see that each of the women that he married wasn't marrying him because, hey, this will be convenient. Hey, this is a well-known man. They all knew the difficulty that came with living with the Prophet ﷺ. His life was just had so much difficulty in it. There's a verse in the Quran that actually, I, I really love this imagery. I think this, I, this same imagery is actually in the Bible in a number of different holy books, subhanAllah that is talking about taking metal ore and putting it into the fire. And all the, the gunk bubbles out and all you're left with is actual gold. And we're going, like, whatever difficulty you're going through, a lot of the times it's just purification. Yeah, hopefully by the end of it, you end up with gold. SubhanAllah. And this whole idea of like faith and belief, it's really easy to have faith when things are going good. The real test is when things are actually difficult and you're fighting. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he starts trading. There is a point in his life, sorry, there's a point in his life where he's a shepherd. And then he starts doing the same business that almost everyone else in Mecca is doing. They travel to Syria, they travel to Yemen, they trade back and forth. And he's trading back and forth. And at some point, there's this very wealthy, beautiful woman named Khadija, radiallahu anha. And she needs to hire someone. So she hires these traders and she partners with them. And what made her different from all of the other merchants in Medina, like, and, and I just want to, she ran her own company. She was like the CEO of a company. And every time she hired someone in that company, she gave them the benefits package where she said, you actually own a stake in the company because this is a partnership. I'm not just hiring you. And when I'm done, you're done. SubhanAllah, which is, I think is truly beautiful about who she is. And it shows her character. And Khadija radiallahu anha is just this powerful, beautiful woman in Mecca. She's, she's very wealthy. And she hires the Prophet ﷺ because she needed someone to go trade. And when she hires him, وسلم, she actually sends, her, sends a servant with him just to like check on him. She didn't tell him, this guy's here to check on you. But she sends him just to like keep eyes on what's going on. And this man is the name of, by the name of Maisara. And forgive me if I'm using too many names. <laughs> if anyone gets lost in the names, just start waving at me or something. So the Prophet Sallallahu and Maisara, they're going on this trip. He's trading on behalf of Khadija radiallahu anha. And what Maisara sees of the Prophet Sallallahu just blows his mind. First of all, he's saying we were trading and people are trading and they tell him, swear by Lati wal Uzza, swear by the gods of Mecca. And he said, I never worshiped the gods of Mecca for me to swear by them. I'm telling you the truth. And subhanAllah, you see the character of the Prophet said, and Maisara seeing this, he's like, oh wow, that's interesting. Because Khadija radiallahu anha also never worshipped any of the other prophets of, Me of Mecca, sorry, any of the other gods of Mecca. Her whole life, she was also someone that only believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are a minority among the people in Mecca, but she was one of them. And she was one of them because her cousin Waraka was actually a Christian scholar that translated the Bible into Arabic. And she would study with him, and she was a monotheist, and she was studying with her cousin. Really, she had her own knowledge, radiallahu anha, which I think is really amazing. Again, a lot of the times we're like, oh, she married the Prophet, so I said it. No, she was, she was a formidable person in her own right. She believed in this. So Maisara sees this, and he's really impressed by it. And the other thing that happens is that Maisara gets sick. Maisara is the servant that's there to help the Prophet, so I said him. He gets sick, and the Prophet, so I said him, stops and takes care of him. Clearly, he wasn't some elitist that is like, oh, I'm better than everyone else. You're here to serve me. You're sick. Tough luck for you. <laughs> SubhanAllah, we know that's not the character of the Prophet So Maisara comes back. He comes running back. And he's telling Khadija, this happened and that happened. And he's telling her, he's telling her he's exactly like you. He believes like you. Sallallahu And you can imagine Khadija, and she's like, hmm, this guy is interesting. Something else that happened while they were on that trip there was a celebration for the, the people of Bani Tamim. 
which is the tribe of Khadija radiallahu anha. So they're in this celebration, and the women are have their own era around the Kaaba, and they're celebrating. And she's hanging out with all the other women, and this man comes on the women's side, and he gets stuck in the middle of the group of women. He says, Ya Nisla'a Bani Tamim, O women of Bani Tamim. There's about to come a prophet from among you. Whoever can marry him should. His name is Ahmed. And all the other women, well, sorry, I'm Arab, so I can make fun of my own people. So the Arab women are like, really, what are you doing on the women's side? We don't care about your message. Get out. <laughs> and they gave him a hard time about it. But Khadija just sat there and listened. She's like, huh, that's interesting. My cousin's been telling me about this. He's been teaching me about prophets. SubhanAllah. So you can imagine this stuff is happening and she's seeing all these different signs and she's seeing the true character of the Prophet ﷺ and he comes back and Maisar is running back to tell her all these stories and she's waiting for the Prophet ﷺ to come back and she sees him walk back into Mecca and there's two clouds that are just following him وسلم, shading him from the sun. SubhanAllah, like she's just like, that's it. <laughs> Khadija anha had sworn off men. Her first two husbands had passed away. She'd had children from her first two husbands. She swore off men. She's like, that's it. I'm not doing this. I'm just going to raise my kids. I'm going to run my business. I'm not interested anymore. But the Prophet ﷺ comes back, and she's interested. <laughs> <laughs> and what she does is she sends her friend, by, a woman by the name of Nusayba. Actually, she doesn't send her friend. Her friend sees her just sitting there. She's like, just lost in thought. And Nusayba comes to her. She's like, what's going on? You're a woman with a good head on her shoulders. What, what's, what's got you all messed up? And she tells her this man, Muhammad Wasallam. She said, There's, I've never seen anyone with character like his. I've never seen anyone that is just as amazing as this man. And she tells her, she's like, Khadija, are you interested in him? And she said, yes. And she's like, well, here, let me, let me go deal with it. So Nusayba goes to the Prophet Wasallam, And she goes to the Prophet Wasallam. and she tells him, why didn't, you know, you're 25. Why didn't you get married? Which is really funny, because if you're single in the Muslim community, this happens to you a lot. <laughs> and it's, what, the other thing that's interesting is, for the Arabs, the Arabs had two modes. You were, either, you were either a child or able to bear children and therefore should get married. So by the time he's the age of, and this post, more, most pre-modern societies looked like this. It, was one of, it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution, sorry, tangent. After the Industrial Revolution, we decided there's this thing called teenagers. <laughs> but most pre-modern societies, if you were old enough to get married, you got married. And the Prophet was 25. He had years worth of opportunity to get married. And he told her, I won't get married. I don't have the means to do it. And she's like, but you trade. And he said, yes. But there's a family that took me in. And I'm providing for the family that took me in. All of the Prophet is money, and this just goes to show the loyalty that he had. His uncle took him in, and he kept all the money that he made. He would give it to his uncle because his uncle had ten children, and he was supporting his uncle's family. SubhanAllah, such a high level of nobility, and that's the point where he didn't get married because he didn't start his own family because he was still supporting the family that took him in. So I said, So she tells him, but what if this woman is rich and doesn't need money? And there's two narrations. One of them, he, sa he says, who? Do you mean Khadija? <laughs> and there's another narration where she says, what about Khadija? So Allah alam which one is the truth, but clearly he was into the idea in the first place. That he's like, oh, what about Khadija? And she said, well, you know, let, let me go ask her. She knows her friend's interested. She sent her, but she didn't want to sell her friend short. So she's like, here, let me, let me go ask her. And she runs back to Khadija. She's like, yeah, yeah, he's into it too. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it's really beautiful. They get married. And Prophet is 25. There's a difference of opinion whether she was 28 or 40. The Arabs did not care about age. So there's so many points where there's like discussions that we know the age of the Prophet. But for the ages of everybody else, nobody really knew or cared. Like it was just not a thing the Arabs cared about. SubhanAllah. Anyways, they get married. And the person whose life, there's no one in human history whose life is written in more detail than the Prophet Like we, we know, like Anas radiallahu counted how many white hairs was in his beard. We know how many white hairs was on his head. We know exactly his height. We know everything that he did. Like we just, there's no one in human history whose life was written in more detail than the Prophet 
Him and Khadija fall off the face of the earth for 10 years. He has zero public appearances. No one knows what they're doing, except that we know that they had children later. We know their children and the people that lived in their house told their own stories later. But in terms of public appearances, they didn't do that. One of the things that's funny, because again, if you're in the Muslim community, you get married and they're like, what, you're just going to fall off the face of the earth now? If they fall off the face of the earth for less than 10 years, that's fine. The Prophet ﷺ did. What you're building is something that is so much more valuable than anything else that you're going to be doing. And this isn't to say you should isolate yourself. You should probably still show up to events. <laughs> but it's not necessary. Like, what you're building is so important that you investing time in your marriage is important. It's the foundation of everything that we're doing. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija radiallahu they end up having four daughters and two boys. Their son and Qasim, Wallahu Adam, Allah knows best that the narration, some narrations say that he was actually the oldest. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ was known as Abu Qasim, the father of Al Qasim. When he was born, the Prophet ﷺ, not too long after he was born, you know how you teach a child how to ride a bike or a tricycle? The Prophet ﷺ was starting to teach him how to ride a horse. Again, Allah knows best, he was probably around four years old when he passed away. You can imagine the pain that they're going through. They lost their firstborn child. And then their second child was Zainab radiallahu anha. And then they had four daughters. So they had Zainab radiallahu anha. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention this. So every time I mention the name of anyone that was that surrounded the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his prayers and blessings be upon him, any of his companions, we just out of respect, we, we say radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with them. So if I say someone's name and I go bzz, 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 after, that's what the bzz, 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 is. <laughs> So Zainab, Zainab, and then Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima. And then they also took in other, two other children. So Ali, there's a point where his uncle Abu Talib, the Prophet ﷺ, got married. And now he has his own family. But to help Abu Talib, to help his uncle that helped him, he went to his other uncles and said, Look, Abu Talib can't afford to feed his children. We shouldn't be able to go to sleep at night knowing that this man can't feed his children. So they each kind of took on one of the children of Abu Talib just to raise them and to make sure that they, their, meet, their needs were met. So Ali goes to the house of the Prophet ﷺ, and I believe Jafar goes to the house of Al-Abbas. So again, they're trying to help the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. The other thing that happened, sorry, I forgot to mention this. When, Khadija, when the Prophet ﷺ marries Khadija, the Prophet ﷺ tells, like, he frees Umm Ayman and tells her, look, you really have to go have your own life now. She's the most consistent motherly figure in his life. And at this point, he's telling her, look, I promise you I'm good. And you see the loyalty she had. Until he started his own family, she refused to leave him. And now he gets married. He's about to start his own family. He's telling her, he's like, look, I'm telling you I'm good. You should have your own life too. And she ends up moving to Medina and marrying a man from Khazraj. More about him later because her story is cool. Little <laughs> huh? Anyways, the Prophet ﷺ, he has that many children. The other thing is Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. So again, someone has given the Prophet ﷺ a gift of a, of a young Arab slave named Zayd. And again, the Prophet ﷺ raises him in his own house like he's his own son. So much so that his uncle, his father and his uncle, they laid, they, they've been, his, Zayd was kidnapped. And he was sold into slavery, and his father and his uncle are running and running and running, trying to find their son, until finally they find him in the house of the Prophet ﷺ, and they go to the Prophet ﷺ, and they say, we'll give you everything you want. Just let us have our son back. We'll give you his weight in gold. And the Prophet ﷺ says, yeah, don't give me his weight in gold. Just ask him if he wants to stay or if he wants to go. If you want, he wants to go home with you, he can just go home. You can imagine his father's like, what? <laughs> I was willing to pay his weight in gold, and you just turned it down. And he goes to his son Zayd, he's like, great news, you get to come home. And he's like, yeah, no, I think I want to stay. And his father's like, are you kidding? You would rather be a servant in this man's house? And he tells him, I wasn't a servant. I was never a servant. I was always treated like a son. In all of the years that he lived in the house of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ not once told him, why'd you do this or why'd you not do this? I mean, that's better than most parents. <laughs> And this isn't to put down parenting. It's just it is the character of the Prophet And I just I think it's interesting. I'm going to go on a small tangent for a second. 
slavery was part of a lot of pre-modern societies. And the way that Islam dealt with a lot of these things, the first thing that it did is it when the Prophet ﷺ actually became the leader of a country, the first thing that he did is he closed the doors in which people became enslaved. And he went out of his way to do this. The second thing that he did is he took all of those people and rehumanized them. And he treated them like they were actual human beings. And then the third part of it is that he created all these avenues for people to be able to leave slavery. Part of the problem is we have, I don't know, living in America, we're like, we wrote a declaration of slavery ended. That was 150 years ago. People are still being discriminated against. Like, it, it didn't end because you wrote some law. Things don't end that way. It's a whole economic structure that needs to be dismantled. And you can see how the Prophet ﷺ is doing this gradually so that slavery doesn't come back. SubhanAllah. And just how he rehumanized people. Um Ayman he was his mother. He introduced her as my mother. She refused to leave him until she knew he was okay. Zayd ibn Harith radiallahu anh, who was his adopted son, he refused to leave him, even though technically he was a slave. But you can see just the dignity that the Prophet ﷺ gave people. And then the other ones we'll talk about, inshallah, when we get to Maymunah. Inshallah. When we get to the later wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Is everybody with me? Good? Nobody's falling asleep? Well, you were falling asleep. You wouldn't say yes. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> ah, what happened? Okay. Zainab radiallahu anha. The daughters of the Prophet ﷺ are growing older. The Prophet ﷺ, Zayd is growing up in the house of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Ali radiallahu anha. Zainab radiallahu anha. So Zainab radiallahu anha had a cousin. And his name was Al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah. And every time the Asim al would go and travel, he'd come back and run and tell Zainab everything that he did on his trip. And they were really, really close to each other, like all the time. And then finally, when Zainab was old enough where they, she could get married, Asim al goes to Khadija and he's like, look, if, Khad if Zainab's getting married, I'm calling dibs. Like, I, I get to ask first. And, he, and what's interesting about this is it was the tradition of the Arabs that the oldest daughter has to marry someone from the father's side of the family and not the mother's side of the family. And Al-As ibn Rabi'ah was from the mother's side of the family. So Al-As ibn Rabi'ah officially goes to the Prophet Sallallahu and he says, look, if Zainab can get married, I want, I want to marry her. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, well, I'm going to go ask her. He knows his daughter's interested. He knows they hang out together all the time. But still, he goes and he asks Zainab, he tells her, is this what you really want? She says, yes, this is what I want. And the Prophet ﷺ was not going to break his daughter's heart over a tradition. So Zainab radiallahu marries the love of her life, the guy that she grew up with, that she loved. And the Prophet ﷺ was not going to stand in the way of his daughter's happiness. She gets married, and then his, his side of the family flips out. So Abu Lahab comes knocking on the door of the Prophet ﷺ, and he's like, what did you do? the Arabs, and what are they going to say about us, and this tradition, and blah, 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 blah. And he's like, well, what do you want? He's like, my two sons should marry your next two daughters. So the Prophet ﷺ is like, I'm not going to make a decision. I'm going to go ask them. So he goes and he asks his daughter, Ruqayya and Um Kulthum. And you know how in families there's always the, 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 the siblings that are really close to each other? So Zainab radiallahu was the oldest, and she always took care of Fatima, so they were really close. And then Ruqayya and Um Kulthum were like always together. I don't want to say this out of adab for them, but like me and my sister, we were always like Tweedledee and, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Like we were always together. No matter what happened, we were always together. So Ruqayya and Um Kuthum, they were always together. And they said, sure, we get to go live together. Sure, we're down for this. So they go and they get married and they marry these two brothers. And these two brothers are actually terrible human beings. And they live in their house and they live there for only a short period of time because as soon as the Prophet ﷺ started receiving revelation, to retaliate against him, his uncle told his two sons to divorce the two daughters of the Prophet ﷺ just to shame him. And you think that's a shame because we have this idea of like divorce is such a taboo. They were so happy to be out of there. <laughs> they came home and they're like, sweet, we get to go home. We get to go home to our loving parents, to our loving home. You guys don't even know what love is. You know, this messed up idea of like these traditions and whatever you all want to keep up, that's fine. We want to go home. 
And they go home to the house of their mother and father, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Later, Zainab, the, sorry, Ruqayya radiallahu anha ends up marrying Uthman radiallahu anha because again, there was someone that was super interested. So Uthman radiallahu anha comes running to the Prophet and he's like, so Ruqayya is considering remarriage at any point. Can I marry her? <laughs> and again, the Prophet says, I'm going to go ask my daughter. So he asks her and Ruqayya accepts. There's actually poetry written about them because Uthman radiallahu anha was so well off and he would dote on his wife, Ruqayya, and people actually wrote poetry that if you want to see beauty, if you want to see happiness, you should go see Ruqayya and her husband Uthman. It's just so beautiful, subhanAllah. And you just, there's just so much love in the house of the Prophet The younger daughter, so Umm Kulthum didn't remarry right away. She stayed in the house of the Prophet And Fatima radiallahu was really interesting because again we have this idea that if you're single, it's just, you have to get married. We even have like religious backing that we tell you of like, it's half your deen, you have to do it tomorrow. Be like, calm down, nobody has to get married tomorrow. If you want to get married, get married. If you don't want to, it's not a requirement. That's just not a thing. Especially if it's, if you're going to marry someone that's going to bring you closer to realizing your true potential and bring you closer to Allah than marrying them. If this person is going to take away from that, don't waste your time. We were not put on earth to procreate. We were put on earth to serve Allah. If marriage is a part of that, great. If it's not a part of that, don't waste your time. And if this person is not going to treat you with respect, then why bother? SubhanAllah. So Fatima radiallahu actually refused to get married. She's like, I'm going to live in the house of my parents, and I'm not going to leave my parents. She saw her, daughter, her sisters get married and move away, and she's just like, nope, I'm staying here. And she stayed in the house of the Prophet and refused to leave. SubhanAllah, until she was much older. The Prophet and Khadija were married for 24 years. And they've been through thick and thin together. The Prophet ﷺ started receiving the revelation not too long after the revelation. She got pregnant again. They had another son. They named him in some narrations. They called him At-Tayyib. In other narrations, they called him At-Tahir. Either the pure or the righteous. And Allah knows best what the name was. And it's true of the Arabs that they could give a child multiple names. Again, that child ends up passing away as a toddler. It's very, very difficult on the two of them. There is actually a narration where Khadija radiallahu is crying in her house. And the Prophet is trying to console her and she told him, what, You're, I, I still have milk that is there for a child to be fed and my child's gone. You can imagine the pain that she went through. Abu Lahab, the same jerk that had his sons divorce the daughters of the Prophet when he heard the Prophet lost his son, he celebrated in his own house. And because he was his uncle, there's only a wall that separated the house of the Prophet and the house of Abu Lahab. They're crying in the house of the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Lahab, the jerk, is celebrating in his house saying, Muhammad's lineage is going to die out. He's such a terrible human being. And this was his uncle. Like it only hurts that much more, subhanAllah. And these things didn't stop. Khadija and the Prophet ﷺ only had daughters. And to the Arabs, your, your daughters are not worth it. They don't carry your name. They're not as valuable as sons. And they went around mocking Khadija. And mocking the Prophet and say their lineage is going to die out. They only have daughters. Which would have been fine if they only just legitimately had daughters. But they're actually mourning the loss of their two sons. They lost two children and they're mourning that loss and just hurts that much more. And you can see the attacks that they consistently had on the Prophet and Khadija. But still it never deterred them. They continued, Khadija radiallahu continued to support the Prophet ﷺ both in, like, in terms of money, in terms of emotional support, in terms of whatever it is the Prophet ﷺ, she just always supported him because it wasn't his mission alone. It was something they always did together. Probably the most significant point in the life of Khadija anha. The Prophet ﷺ, when he's about 40 years old, so at this point they've been married 15 years, and he would do this, he started towards the end, he's, Towards right before the revelation came, he started to have these true dreams. So he'd have a dream and he'd wake up the next morning and unfold exactly how it did in his dream. And this kept happening to him. And this was Allah preparing him for the beginning of the revelation. 
And when this thing kept happening, he kept reflecting on his own life, reflecting on his society, reflecting on why these dreams are happening. He used to go out to a cave called Cave Dhar al-Hara. Has anyone ever been to Mecca or Medina? You haven't been to Umrah? How many people went up the cave? No? It's, it's a pretty steep hike. It's like an hour upwards in the sun. Unless if you run marathons. Then it's 20 minutes. And whoever tells you it's 20 minutes is not true. It's because they run marathons. <laughs> Because we took a group and I was, yeah, it took me an hour. And he's climbing up a mountain and he would go and he would sit there. And Khadija radiallahu he would go and he would sit there and he would think. And you do this for extended periods of time. Like he'd pack a lunch and he'd go and he'd, not a lunch, he'd pack enough food for a few days. He'd go, he would sit there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What's interesting about Ghar Hira is you can actually see the Kaaba from there. It's a really tight cave. It only fits about like a person and a half. And he would sit there for extended periods of time. And when he came, he stayed too long and she knew he ran out of food. She would pack food and she would take it up to him. She knew exactly where he was. She'd pack him food and she supported him in his mission of just trying to find out what's going on. Trying to find himself. And it's, this, it's a very specific act of worship. So we usually call it meditation. The Arabs used to call it tahannuth. Where it was specific to people that only believed in one God. Because they were contemplating God. SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ, one of those nights, he's in the cave by himself, and this man dressed in impeccable white, which, again, the reason that's significant is because if you climb up a mountain, by the end of the mountain, your clothes are not still white. He has impeccably white clothes, and he climbs up, and he goes in, and he sees the Prophet ﷺ, and he tells him, read. When the Prophet ﷺ is looking at this man, he's like, I don't read. And of course we know it was the angel Jibreel salam, and he holds the Prophet salam, and he holds him really, really, really tightly and he tells him, read. And he lets him go and the Prophet salam, is still baffled by this man. He's like, I don't read. And the, this man again holds the Prophet salam, really, really tightly and he tells him, read. And he lets him go and the Prophet salam, like the second time he told him, I don't read. The third time he hold, held him and let him go, he told him, what do you want me to read? What, what are you talking about? Because read actually has multiple ways, like the Arabic word of iqra doesn't necessarily just mean read, as in read from a page. It also means to recite. So finally, the third time the Prophet ﷺ is realizing maybe he means read in a different form. And he tells him, what do you want me to read? What do you want me to recite? And this is the beginning of the revelation, the first six ayat of the Qur'an are revealed. He says, read in the name of your Lord who created created man from a single clot. Read and your Lord is the most generous. The one who taught by the pen, taught men what, man what he didn't know. And man here is humankind, what they didn't know. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is in a panic. He's like, what just happened? Like, who was this guy? He runs home to Khadija radiallahu anha. He's terrified, he's shivering. And he goes to Khadija radiallahu anha and he says, zamiluni, zamiluni, dathiruni, dathiruni, cover me, cover me. So he goes to Khadija radiallahu anha, she covers him, she waits until he calms down. She's like, what just happened? And he tells her what happened. And mind you, I love my husband. If my husband ever came home and said, I was in a cave and this dude, he came and he hugged me and this is what happened. And there was an angel and he blocked the horizon and tells me this fictitious story. I'm just going to sit there. I'm like, I love you. We're going to go see a doctor in the morning. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> But Khadija Allah had so much certainty in the Prophet Sallallahu I don't know how she knew this. That she told him, she says, Kalla wallahi la Allahu abada. No, I swear by Allah that he would never forsake you. And she starts listing his good character. She says, Inna kala tasiru al-rahim wa tahmilu al-kal wa taksibu al-ma'adum wa tu'inu ala nawaib al-haq. You lift the downtrod. You're generous to your guests. You help those that are in need. You go in the path of everything that is good. Allah would never forsake someone like you. And the beauty of that is that she saw him for who he was before he was even a prophet. Like it's really easy after someone's like taken over the world, be like, yeah, you know, I'm down for that. He was still struggling. And she saw him for who he was long before anyone else did. And this is why Khadija is who she was. She is the very first believer, period. There's differences of opinion later who then later joined Islam. There is no difference of opinion that she was the very first believer, period. Everyone agrees to it. SubhanAllah. When we think of Islam, the story of Islam could not be told without the story of Khadija radiallahu anha. 
She put in blood, sweat, and tears. They started calling out to other people for the first three years. They made the, the they, he started publicly preaching in the third year. The persecution started not too long after. She watched him through his good, his bad, all the difficulties, sixth year since the beginning of the revelation. They actually took it a step further and said, we're boycotting you. The Muslims went hungry, didn't have food. SubhanAllah. She was rich enough that if she had left the group, she could have made it. But she refused to leave the group and leave her husband. She stayed there and by the end of it, it had worn her body out so much. By the 10th year, she passed away. The weight of her passing was so heavy. It was actually called the year of sorrow. So she passed away and the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Talib, the one that raised him, also passed away in that same year. He was called the year of sorrow because of the passing of Khadija radiallahu anha. Remember Abu Lahab, the jerk that divorced the Prophet Yeah, that jerk? Yeah. When he saw how distraught the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was after the passing of Khadija, he said, I'm never going to hurt him again. He saw just the level of pain that he was in Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's a jerk, he went back, it's just a couple of months, started fighting the Prophet ﷺ again. But even he was so moved by the passing of Khadija. He just saw the state the Prophet ﷺ was in. I feel like I'm losing everyone. No? Keep going? Can I sit? I don't know, is there a sign of life somewhere? I don't know. Does anyone have <laughs> good job? <laughs> Does anyone have any reflections on Khadija? So I heard, um, it was actually Uncle Tamara talk about Khadija and say that, as you mentioned, um, her uncle was and that in fact, when she married the Prophet that she already had an inkling that it was him, that it was the Prophet. And that when you receive revelation, the reason why she consoled him the way that she did was because she said, okay, this is it. These are the, the evidences that we saw, and, uh, you know, you're the coming prophet. Yeah. Have, you, have you heard anything about that? Yes, absolutely. SubhanAllah. So one of the, there were a few narrations, and forgive me, I, I kind of started off saying this was a huge task and we're never going to finish. <laughs> But one of them was the trip, what, the incident that happened during the trip where he first went, when she first, they start, first started working together. That man from Beni, that came and told the women of Beni Tamim, there's a, there's a prophet that's coming, one of you should marry him. All of the narrations from her cousin, Waraka. And there's actually one last one, there's one narration about before she sent her, her friend, Nafisa, the, to go propose to the Prophet Sallallahu and she actually told her, and I feel in my heart that he might actually be the prophet of the end of time. And again, subhanAllah, there's a reason why Khadija radiallahu is who she is. The weight that she had, that she saw him for who he was. How could someone be known as the honest and trustworthy in the society that they're living in? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Khadija radiallahu is truly incredible. They were married for 24 years. The Prophet ﷺ never married anyone else during the time. Even though it was the culture and the tradition of the Arabs to take multiple wives, he never took another wife as long as he was married to Khadija. Oh, you had a question? Just to follow up on that, is there any indication as to whether or not Khadija uh, saw that as a detract, his, uh, coming prop, uh, his being a prophet? Was that something that she found as like, okay, this is a responsibility I'm going to have to take as his potential spouse? Or was she like, oh, hey, no prophet? Well, Adam, I don't know. She never hesitated to support him. So clearly she'd internalized this mission on her own. It was, it was, she was on board. I mean, she already believed that there was only one God. The idea of serving that one God was not alien to her at all. So meeting someone that had the potential of being like someone else that also believed in one God. Someone else that had good character. Someone that had the potential of being that prophet. SubhanAllah. She didn't hesitate once. If anything, she gave him strength anytime because when you're... He's carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. 
And he can feel the weight of it. Even the Quran tells him, we're going to give you a heavy weight. And the way that he would, con Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoled him was that he would pray during the night. And he would run to Khadija radiallahu anha. She was his home. She was his reconciliation to everything that was difficult. Every time something difficult would happen, he'd run to her. I mean, clearly it was their mission that they had together. Actually, interesting thing. So the Prophet said, Jibreel alayhi salam taught the Prophet ﷺ how to pray, the first person he taught was Khadija. And there were so many narrations, the first three years that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would be seen praying with a woman. It was always Khadija. Like they were there right together from day one. Even before day one, before any of this stuff happened, they were together. The other thing that's interesting is we don't actually have any recorded disputes that happened before, between the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija radiallahu anha. Like, they were just so in line with each other. She was clearly his, the love of his life. And this isn't to put down any of the other mothers of the believers, there, but there's, I mean, there's recorded disagreements that he had with Aisha radiallahu with Hafsa radiallahu They had arguments, as any marriages do. He just never had one with Khadija radiallahu anha. SubhanAllah, question. Um, just a minute ago you said that her friend that went to the Prophet Oh, my bad. It was Nafisa, not Nusaybo. Okay. I apologize. No, no. Last question, and then we can. Go ahead. Uh, do we know much about the parents of Khadija and what might have inspired her character development as she was growing up? We don't know a lot about them. We know that her father was, she was mostly raised by her mother. Her father was, he actually got a little too drunk at their wedding. <laughs> that the next morning that they're like, he's like, who's this guy? And they're like, yeah, he married your daughter last night. <sighs> her father was a very absent father. She was mostly raised by her mother and she was very close to her sister. She had a lot of very strong women in her life. SubhanAllah. But on that note of women going to the Prophet and saying, hey, what about so-and-so? Maybe you should get married. There is another woman by the name of Khawla radiallahu anha. Which, and the reason I bring this up, like how people get married, there's so, so many stories of how people get married. It's a different story every time. But we just, I don't know. A lot of the times people get married through friends. If someone's suggesting something and they genuinely care about you, there's there there's no written rules of how you should get married. And you can see, we'll see, inshallah, when we get to the other mothers of the believers, they each had a different story. But in this case, there was another woman that went to the Prophet ﷺ and she says, you know, I feel like you're really distraught after the passing of Khadija radiallahu anha. And I want to look at, uh, what's it called? She told him, I can feel, I see that you've, you're feeling this huge sense of loss after the passing of Khadija radiallahu anha. And the Prophet ﷺ is clearly still very distraught. He tells her, yes, and then she said, Ajal, كانت أم العيال وربة البيت. Of course, she was the mother of my children. And she was, she was the queen of this house. Of course I miss her. SubhanAllah. And I just, it's interesting, because again, we're talking about this idea of a perfect family. At this point, the Prophet ﷺ is a single father. He has two daughters at home. He has two daughters that are married living elsewhere, but he has two daughters at home. Ali radiallahu anhu is still living with him. There's just so much that's happening in his house. It's not, we look at single fathers and be like, yeah, is he ever going to find someone? Why not? The Prophet ﷺ was a single father. And he, Khadija radiallahu anhu was a single mother. Like she had two children from previous marriages. We forget that he was her third husband. And for anyone that is just like, oh, I'll never marry a woman that was married before. Really? You think you're better than the Prophet ﷺ? He was her third husband. Didn't take away from their marriage at all. SubhanAllah. This woman goes to the Prophet ﷺ and she tells him, like, you miss Khadija? And she said, yes. And she kind of suggests he get married again. And he felt so, she said, I saw the pain in his face. I saw the tears well up in his eyes, Sallallahu Alaihi She said, I wish I hadn't said anything. And he looks at her and he says, Woman bad Khadija, really, who's after Khadija? She said in that moment, I just regretted it. But at the same time, he asked her, he's like, no, really, who do you mean? And she's telling him, like, 
Who's going to be for your house? Who's going to raise your children? Who's going to help you out? And he's just in so much pain. He's like, who do you actually mean? Who do you have in mind? Because clearly she was there ready to suggest people. So she goes and she tells him, I have two suggestions. One of them is Sauda bint Zama and Aisha radiallahu anha. So the, there's, and it's significant why she mentions Aisha radiallahu anha. So Aisha is the son of Abu Bakr. No, it's daughter of Abu Bakr. Yeah, sorry. Grammar is not my thing and like, gen whatever. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so Aisha radiallahu anha, we, we talked about how Khadija radiallahu anha was there from the beginning. His best friend Abu Bakr was there from the beginning. The other person that never hesitated whether he should follow the Prophet or not was Abu Bakr. So there is narration where, where the Prophet himself said, every time I told, proposed Islam to someone, they all hesitated. The only one that didn't was Abu Bakr He's like, when do I start? Which way do I go? Just point. You know expression? You say, jump, you say jump, we say how high? It's like, how high? Where do we go? Out of the 10 that were promised Jannah, five of them were actually brought to Islam by Abu Bakr And there's a specific narration about 10 people at the time of the Prophet peace be upon him, that were promised Jannah. Like the first day, they start receiving the, the Prophet was receiving the revelation Abu Bakr is just out on a mission. So the reason she suggests the daughter of Abu Bakr is because she knows that he's still part of that initial tight-knit group. And this is why she's suggesting Aisha radiallahu anha. And the Prophet ﷺ, actually in one of the narrations, he tells her, she's, she's still kind of young. Like, I don't know about this. She tells him, well, you don't have to marry her now. It's just an idea. You can propose, you don't have to get married. Which is another thing that's interesting. I, like, I don't know. I, I work with college students, and every so often someone will come to my office, and she'd be like, there's a boy and he likes me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, one, do you like him back? First question. Two, just because you're talking to someone doesn't mean you have to get married tomorrow. It's okay. And then the second one was Sauda bin Tazama. And we're going to talk about Sauda anha first. How much time do I have? Okay. We have to, mind, have to go a little faster. So Sayyidah Sauda anha, she's really interesting. So she was actually, so the beginning, when Islam first started, there were families that became Muslim together. So Sauda radiallahu and her family all became Muslim together. And her and her husband, they were facing persecution and they actually were part of the group that first migrated to Habasha. And I, something that I talked to Ahmed about this right before, earlier. There are very little descriptions of what they actually looked like. Sauda's name means the one who has black skin. I don't know if she was black. Her, in terms of her lineage, she had Arab fathers. But Allah Alam, they were intermixed enough. Also, the Arabs are really descriptive with things. I don't think they would call her Sauda unless if she actually had darker skin. Allah Alam. Anyway, so she married Sayyidah Sauda Radiallahu her and her husband actually went to Habasha. They, they migrated to Abyssinia when the persecution started. And there are just so many people that were under this persecution. They left and they migrated to Habasha. And there was a point where they were actually on their way back. And on their way back, she had a dream that the, there was a full moon and that the full moon went out. She woke up from the dream kind of weirded out by it. So she told her husband and her husband told her I had, he told her I have this feeling, I don't think, I, oh, just I'm not hating. He told her I have this feeling, I don't think I'm going to live for very long. And her husband actually ended up passing away on the journey back. So she's coming back into Mecca. She was one of the early believers. She's been persecuted. Like, again, they were running away from persecution. They migrated to a different city. They left their home to seek protection. And now she's coming on her way back to the place she ran away from, except her husband's passed away, and she's there on her own. So you can imagine the pain that she is going through. And this is part of the reason that Sayyidina Khawla actually suggested her. She said, look, she's in her family. She's, she's really, really struggled. And she's a good person. She can help you out. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, okay, go talk to Sayyidah Sauda. So she go talk, goes and talks to Sayyidah Sauda. And Sayyidah Sauda is like completely blown away. She's like, are you serious? The Prophet Sallallahu wants to marry me? She says, I want to, but you have to go ask my dad. Which is really funny for an older woman to say, go ask my dad. And her dad was still alive and out of respect for her father. And her fa she, So Sayyidah Khawla goes to her father and she says, the Prophet's proposing to your daughter. And her father is not even Muslim. He's like, but he's a good dude. He's a good man. 
what is your friend thing? And she's like, she's, she says she accepts. And he's like, all right, well, then I accept too. And the Prophet ﷺ marries Sayyidah Sauda. And what's interesting, because again, there's like, we talk about them like they're like superhuman. They're very much human. Khadija radiallahu was well known in Mecca as this woman of like great status, great beauty, great wealth. She passes away and the Prophet ﷺ marries Sauda and Always in every society, people compare women and be like, really, she passed away and you married her? Imagine how painful that was for Sayyidah Sawda But that didn't deter her from trying to console the Prophet ﷺ. There's actually one narration that she was heavier set. So she would intentionally walk in front of the Prophet ﷺ and walk like a penguin just to make him laugh. She helped with his children. She just, she was just happy to be part of another family. And there isn't a greater family than the Prophet ﷺ. And you can see just throughout her life, she was just the caring mother. Even though that wasn't her original family, all she did was just mother and care and nurture for everyone else. SubhanAllah. And the Prophet ﷺ was only married to her until they went, they actually migrated. And then after the migration, he married Aisha radiallahu anha. But I just think it's so beautiful that again, the Prophet ﷺ, she was the only one that was like besides Khadija, she was the only one that was married to the Prophet ﷺ just on her own. And she was married to him for a couple of years before the migration, subhanAllah. So it was about three years. Anyways, so that was the story of Sauda radiallahu anha. The story of Aisha radiallahu anha, so around the same time that the Prophet ﷺ proposes to Sauda, Khawla radiallahu anha also goes and proposes to Aisha. So she goes, and she goes to her mom, and she's like, great news! Prophet ﷺ agreed to officially propose to your daughter. She says, that is great news. Except we've already been talking to someone else. And we don't break our oaths. SubhanAllah, like it just, what's so stunning to me is that clearly this is the better option. But yet it goes to show their character as a family of like, no, we gave our word. Our word doesn't just go to nothing. And she was actually engaged to the son of Al-Mut'am ibn Adi. And what's interesting about Al-Mut'am ibn Adi, he was actually someone of, he never became Muslim, but he very consistently protected the Muslims from persecution. And it was something that the Muslims always thanked him for. SubhanAllah. And it just goes to show his character. That even though he wasn't following the religion, that didn't feel, he didn't feel like that deterred him in any way, shape, or form from protecting a religious minority. And protecting people from believing whatever they wanted to believe. SubhanAllah. So he is engaged to the, to the daughter of Abu Bakr. And he knows that Abu Bakr is best friends with the Prophet He knows he's on this mission. So the Pro Abu Bakr, he says, look, I can't, I can't just break a word. I'm going to go back and talk to him. So he goes back and he talks to him. And the microphone's out. No? Back on? He goes and he talks to him and he tells him, so, what do you think? And Mutan Adi's wife is like, are you still following that man, Muhammad? Sallallahu Alaihi and he's like, yep, totally still following him. Like, totally, like, hardcore in. Because <laughs> he doesn't want to be the one to say no. But he, he, want, he doesn't want it to work out. He wants his daughter to work out with someone else. So he tells him, he's like, man, this is way too much for us. He's like, yeah, it could be too much. And they're like, all right, fine. We're breaking off the engagement. And they break off the engagement. Abu Bakr al like, comes home running. He's like, we're done. <laughs> we're done with the first engagement. I think it's interesting to mention because Aisha Radulan has the one where people are consistently saying like, oh, she was really young. And they very consistently use her age against her. There's two problems with this. One, clearly she was engaged before. This wasn't something that was out of the norm for the Arabs at all. The Arabs of his time fought the Prophet said him tooth and nail. Nobody ever held it against him. Nobody thought it was a thing. It was very normal for their culture. That's one. And two, the problem of doing that is that you're taking away her voice. The Prophet ﷺ passed away and for years she did nothing but continue to protect and deliver his message. ﷺ. So for us to look at her and be like, yeah, no, this poor oppressed woman. Really, did you listen to her? Anytime someone's like, oh, women in Islam are oppressed, I'm like, seriously, have you heard of Aisha <laughs> She was the scholar of the most religious community in Islamic history. And she would go around correcting the Sahaba. She'd go around telling them, like, no, no, you didn't do this right. No, no. 
She was the most knowledgeable out of anyone else in that society, and they all respected her and gave her her respect. And it never occurred to her as a woman that she wasn't supposed to speak her opinion. SubhanAllah. I just, yeah, you can't in the name of women's rights ignore the voice of the one woman at the center. Radiallahu anha. SubhanAllah. But Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she, she is a character. <laughs> So after this, the Prophet ﷺ actually has dreams where Jibreel ﷺ brings him this, this silk cloth. And in that silk cloth is the image of Aisha radiallahu anha. And he tells him, she is going to be your wife both in this life and the next life. Aisha radiallahu anha is so amazing that she makes a point to narrate that herself. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying about who she was. Like it just, the, the idea that she shouldn't speak her mind never even occurs to her. She marries the Prophet ﷺ. She was much younger. And yes, that is a power dynamic. But there isn't a power dynamic than being married to the Prophet of a people. Forget a king. Kings can be loved. They can also be feared and can also be hated. Prophets necessitate the fact that people are willing to bet their lives on him. And they do. So if you're at the center of this and you're married to that man... Can you imagine the first disagreement you have with him? The junk people are going to say about you? And it's, subhanAllah, it's so amazing. They did have disagreements. She was very young. And every time they had a disagreement, he would come to her defense. So there was a point where she has, they have this disagreement, and then he's like, look, how do you want to settle this? So he tells her, look, let's go to Omar. He's a just man. She's like, nope, he's one of your guys. We're not going to Omar. Pick someone else. He's like, do you want to go to Abu Bakr? He's literally her father. So he says, okay. She's, they're going to go to Abu Bakr. They had a disagreement. They're arguing about it. And he tells his side of the story, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to Abu Bakr. And she gets frustrated halfway through. And she's like, that's not what happened. And Abu Bakr is like, did you just... Did you just call the... Like, did you just call the messenger that he's not telling the truth? He, like, loses it. And he's about to lose it on his daughter. And the Prophet said him, he stands between him and his daughter and says, Calm down, you're here to mediate. You're not, you're not supposed to take sides. What are you doing? You can't just take my side. You didn't even hear her side yet. Like there isn't a more intense power dynamic than that. And yet there's so many points where she just he treated her like she was his equal. They would ask her, so a lot of, they would ask her, like, well, how did the pro how is the Prophet peace be upon him at home? She said, oh, you know, he does normal stuff at home. He fixes this, he puts that, he cleans this, he sees whoever's servants cleaning up, he helps them out. You know, normal stuff. It's so stunning to me. Like, how can she be saying this about him? And there's so many points where they would have war secrets, and he wouldn't trust anyone besides Aisha with the war secret. There was actually a point where her father goes to her and he's like, so, are you going to tell me what's going on? She's like, nope. He told me not to tell. Not telling you. SubhanAllah. There's so many points in the life of Aisha radiallahu anha. There's, sorry, I don't want to, uh, I want to make sure I give time to everyone else. But this is a real, really cool story. So right after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi marries her, there's, a, there's an event that's happening in the masjid. And there's a group of Ahbash, and they do this thing where they, they have a dance with spears. And they're like, I don't know, it's a, it's a dance. And they're doing this in the middle of the masjid. And the Prophet them, so she can't see. She's still young, she's shorter. And the Prophet them, tells her, can you see? And she's like, no, I can't see. So he helps her get up. And she, what she does is she sticks her cheek next to the Prophet and she just sits there. And the Prophet is like, okay, we've been watching this a while. Are you done? She's like, nope. I'm going to just sit here. And she was very intentionally doing it so everyone can see her with the Prophet ﷺ on their own. Like, she just, she was a woman. This is what she did. SubhanAllah. There are other points. There was another narration that was interesting. There was a point where Hafsa radiallahu someone else made food. And everyone's enjoying this food. And she's watching this. She's starting to get really jealous. So she knocks over the plate. The plate falls, all the food dumps on the floor, and everyone watches this. Like, you can imagine there's like this feast, and you just knocked over the table with all the food on it. 
and everyone knows you did it on purpose. And everyone stops and looks at you. And she's kind of just standing there. And the prophet I said him just goes, stands between them and her. And she says, it's okay. She just got jealous. It's okay. Then he goes to Aisha al and he's like, you know, your, your plate, her plate broke. Give her yours because you broke her plate. We all know you did this on purpose, so just give her back her plate. We'll be fine. And it's fine. SubhanAllah. There was another point where her and the Prophet ﷺ started racing. And they went on this race and she won the first time. And then a couple of years later she put on more weight and they raced and he won and she's like, well, I won last time. Because she just, it's just who she was. She never just like, she never stopped challenging him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's part of what he, what he loved about her. There was a point where he actually got angry at his wives and he's like, that's it, I'm leaving. And he leaves and he says, I'm going to be gone for a month. And he comes back 29 days later and she's like, you said a month. And he he's, tells her, he's like, well, the Arab month can be 29 or 30 days. It's okay. And she's like, okay. It's just who she was, Radulah She always asked him questions. There was no one that asked more questions than Aisha Radulah We have this image of like the perfect woman sits in a corner, is quiet. Oh my God, Aisha Radulah asked lots of questions. And that's why she was a scholar. SubhanAllah. Um, what else? What else? Oh, okay. So the fifth year of the Hijrah. They were coming back. There were so many different narrations that actually happened because of Oh, this is funny. So they were on a journey. They were coming back from a battle. And she had borrowed a necklace from say the Asma, her sister, and then she forgot the necklace and then she couldn't find the necklace. And then she made the army stop until she found the necklace. She's like, I have to give back the necklace. And the army, whole army of people ended up being delayed for her looking for her necklace. So much so that they ran out of water. And the next prayer was coming in and they didn't have enough water to make the next prayer. Because they have to do wudu, you have to wash before prayer. And then people are starting to get really, really angry at her. You're holding up an entire army of people for a necklace. Like, what are you doing? And subhanAllah, what ended up happening is that verses were revealed that if you run out of water, you can do tayammu. You can purify yourself with the earth. Verses were revealed from the sky, from the heavens, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till the end of time because Aisha Allah was looking for a necklace. SubhanAllah, we think these things are so trivial. But Aisha Allah, she just, I mean, she, again, she, is who, she was who she was. There was another battle. She was really light. So the mothers of the believers, almost every time there was a battle that they would just, the Prophet said and treated everyone equally. So they would just pick out of a hat or whatever it was, whatever the version of that was to see whose turn it was to come. So she was on this battle and she had something called the Hawdaj, which is like a little tent kind of thing that they put on top of the camels. So she was in her Hawdaj and then she went to use the bathroom and she was so light, they didn't tell the difference whether she was in it or not. So they put the empty haldaj on top of the camel and they left. So she goes, uses the bathroom and comes back and the army's gone. <laughs> so she's like, okay, now what do I do? So she ends up sitting there and waiting. She knows that there's a scout that comes out behind the army and tries to figure out if someone dropped anything or whatever it was. So she figures, look, someone will realize that I'm gone and they'll come back for me. So she kind of just sat there. She sat under next to a rock for a while. And she got tired, she fell asleep, and she woke up. The scout had come, and he kept saying Salaam Alaikum really loud until finally she woke up and she heard him. So then he woke her up and she, he recognized who she was. And she herself says that this was before hijab, like she didn't always wear hijab, so the hijab, they, the, the mothers of the believers used to actually also cover their face. So he recognized her because she'd fallen asleep and her face cover wasn't there. But he knew her from before, so he kept saying salams, he knew who she was. So she woke up, he put her on his horse, and he took her back into Medina. When you're the leader, there are people that are out to get you. So they're coming into, back into Medina. It's a completely innocent interaction. But there were people that hated the Prophet ﷺ and saw them together and said, Hmm, I wonder what they were doing together. And it's interesting because we, 
saying something scandalous about someone, you don't actually have to go out outright accuse someone of something terrible to sully their reputation. So they started this rumor. And she came back from that trip and she actually got really sick. So she was sick for about a month. And she didn't find out that any of this stuff was happening until the last three days. So after a, like the last three days of this month, like all this stuff has been going on and the story kept spreading and spreading and spreading. And it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Where the same people that were out to get the Prophet ﷺ, they're like, you know, we, we saw him go into the house of the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he wasn't there. Again, you're not actually specifically accusing someone of something. But you're just propagating this rumor. And this rumor kept spreading and spreading and spreading. And the reason this is significant, if someone like Aisha Radzullah can't defend herself against scandalous rumors, really none of us have a chance. This is why you are not allowed to accuse someone of something. And it's interesting because there's points where her father, they asked him, what if you actually saw two people actually committing adultery? He said, you know what I would do? I would cover them so no one else could see. We don't go out of our way to either expose people or to accuse them of things. Even if you know someone's doing something wrong, give them the space to repent. We are never going to go on a witch hunt. We shouldn't go on a witch hunt. Anyone that goes on a witch hunt in the name of religion, you're doing it wrong. What benefit do you get of someone else's sin being exposed? That's if they committed the sin. So what if they even didn't even commit the sin and you're accusing them? It's funny, I did this with my Sunday school girls. So I went and I'm like, oh guys, this happened, but I can't tell you. And they're like, what? And I'm like, there's this imam. And they're like, oh no. And I'm like, yeah, his wife? Someone saw her in the car with someone else. And they're like, well, who was it? I'm like, I don't know, some dude. And they're like, and then what? And I'm like, and I used all of the same rumors. And I'm like, and then they saw this guy go to their house. And when the, husband, when the imam wasn't there, and they're like, oh my God. The point where I had to end it was they were like Googling imam scandal. <laughs> like, and I'm like, calm down. That, they're all the same stories. And when you hear it out of context, we're all sitting, because we've all heard this. We've all heard this said about someone. You're like, hmm, that person, that brother, this sister, don't trust them. We've heard this. We've heard that. We don't go around selling people's reputations. The one and only except, not the one and only. The really few exceptions to that is if someone's actually going into business with someone, if they have a reputation of being a thief, tell the person they're going into business with. You don't spread, you don't spread it to everyone else. You tell the person because they're going into business with them. The same thing with marriage. If someone's getting married and you're like, this person has a reputation of not being faithful. I'm not going to tell the whole world. I'm just going to tell you because it directly affects you. So any, I don't know, almost every time Donald Trump got married, someone should have told his wife, this is his reputation. Almost every single time he was starting a business with someone, be like, he has a bad reputation of not paying people. And that's an extreme example. But really, that's the point where you start protecting people. You can't say, I'm going to go tell the whole world your sin because I'm protecting other people. No, you're not. You're just exposing a scandal. If someone's getting married or going into business, and that's the point where you're actually supposed to tell the truth. Make sense? Well, again, verses were revealed. So Aisha radiallahu anha, the Prophet sallallahu is like seeing all this stuff and he's struggling to defend his wife. Because what's he going to say? Don't talk about it? He was never a dictator in that society. He was never the person that's like, no, that's it. We're not allowed to talk. He was just, that wasn't him. So I sent him. And he's really struggling to defend his wife. He's like, what am I supposed to do? So he goes and he consults with his people. He's like, what do I do? So he goes to Umar and he tells him, oh, Umar, like, what do I do? He tells him, well, who married you off to her? He said, Allah. And he's like, do you really think Allah would give you a bad deal? He's like, no. But why are you telling me? Go tell everybody else, Umar. So he started a counter campaign of like, this is who she actually is. And because this accusation is significant, there was an investigation where they went and said, if this man was going into the house of the Prophet, ﷺ, someone would have saw. 
the houses of all of the mothers of the believers, we're, we're, we think like it's huge. They didn't have houses like ours. Their houses are, are walk-in closets. Not in New York. That's actually a New York apartment. <laughs> but for us here, it's, it's really small space, and they're right next to each other. Like they shared walls. Did anyone see this man go into their house? Nope. Where are all the character witnesses? There wasn't a single witness to anything that was wrong. And the prophet like, and goes out and tells people, he's like, look, there isn't a single witness to these rumors. These rumors have no basis. And in the midst of all of this, she's so frustrated because, again, she's a woman. She doesn't care that, like, yes, her husband's the leader. She just wants her husband to go be like, how dare you lie about my wife? So she asks him, can I go stay in the house of my parents? And he, she goes to the house of her parents, عنهم, and she tells her mother, she's like, did you hear this junk? She tells her, it's okay, you're young, you're beautiful. People get jealous. She's trying to calm her daughter. She goes to her father, and her father's in tears. He's like, before we believed in Islam, no one accused us of junk like this. Now we're being accused, he's hurt by his own community. He's like, what just happened to us? There's, mm, no, I can't go on this tangent. I'm going to focus on Aisha radiallahu What ends up happening is the Prophet ﷺ comes to the, her family's house, and he tells her something, and he tells her, look, if you want to say something, say something. And she gets really angry at him. She tells him, if I tell you I did it, everyone would readily believe me. But if I tell you I didn't do it, everyone would pretend to believe me, but still have an ounce of doubt. I actually don't have any way to completely defend myself. And while they're in the, he's in that house, وسلم, there's verses that are revealed that actually exonerate her. Again, verses are revealed from the creator of the heavens and the earth till the end of time to exonerate Aisha. Radiallahu. And she herself, like she's saying, like the verses are revealed and her parents are like, go run, go to your husband. She's like, no, he's not the one that exonerated me. It was Allah. I'm going to go pray to Allah and then come back and talk to him. So she goes and she thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then she comes back to her husband. SubhanAllah. Sayyidah Khadija, he was her third husband. Sayyidah Sauda, he was her second. The Prophet Sallallahu was her second husband. For Aisha radiallahu anha and only Aisha. He was her one and only love. Everyone remembers their first crush. Everyone remembers their first everything. He was her first. He wasn't just her first, he was her everything. He, he was the only love that she ever had in her life, Sallallahu Alaihi You can see why she was who she was, why she was so protective of him. There was a point where he went to do something and she ran after him. And he's like, you know, I'm just running an errand. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> he's trying to calm her down. And she tells him, how could someone like me not be jealous over someone like you? You could see how much love she had for him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't want to talk about... She's very significant in the end of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have 10 minutes left. Can someone like wave at me? Thanks. Oh, shoot. Um, yeah. Sorry, there's just really we went through three. <laughs> okay, so the third year of the Hijra is actually a really difficult time. So the after the migration, people we we think of Medina as this like magic land. The first two years, they're actually sleeping with their weapons on them because there were raids that Mecca would send at night. So every night they would go to sleep with their weapons and they would sleep with one eye open. This was not some, I don't know, it wasn't some like magic time where you were just like floating on a carpet and you didn't have any problems. They were really, really difficult times. The second year of the Hijra was the Battle of Batr. And it was a huge decisive battle and the Muslims ended up winning that battle. And then a year later, there was the Battle of um, sorry, Uhud. Thank you. So the Battle of Uhud was in the third year of the Hijra. It was such a stunning defeat to the Muslims, they lost 7% of their army in a day. There were a thousand men that went out to this battle from Medina. 70 of them were killed. 
There were rumors that the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself was killed. They didn't end up being true, but there, were, there was just so much chaos that was happening. And after the battle, there's these children that would run out to the battlefield and they'd call out their father's names. And they kept calling and calling and calling, and when their fathers wouldn't answer, the children would just sit there and cry. Because they knew that, meant that they, it meant their fathers were killed. And the Prophet ﷺ would scoop up these children, he'd lift them up, and he'd tell them, I'm your father now, Aisha is your mother now. And he tried everything that he could to protect these children that had lost their fathers. And again, when you imagine the weight of it, he knows they died fighting for him. Fighting for his message, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the weight of that. He knows that they died because they believed in him. He's lifting up these children, and one of the things that he did, and this is again the tradition of the Arabs, that he started marrying widows. He didn't marry anyone else up until that point, but the first person that he married afterwards was actually Hafsa radiallahu anha. So she was the daughter of Umar. After her husband is killed, Umar is going on this mission of like, I need to find my, my daughter another husband, because he's Umar. Like, he doesn't wait for things to happen. He goes out and does them. It's just who he is. So he goes out and he's trying to find a husband for his daughter and he's like, there's nobody better than Abu Bakr. Okay, Abu Bakr, you're marrying my daughter Hafsa. And Abu Bakr al just goes quiet. And he gets really angry at him. He's like, what do you mean you don't want to marry your daughter Hafsa? He didn't even give him a chance to speak. <laughs> And Abu Bakr al didn't want to say anything, he just walked away. So he's like, man, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with him? He goes to Uthman al and he's like, can you believe Abu Bakr? Man, that guy. Okay, you're going to marry my daughter Hafsa. <laughs> and at that point, Uthman al goes quiet, and he's like, what is wrong with you guys? What are you doing? And Uthman al just very gently, quietly tells him, go talk to the Prophet Sallallahu so he goes and he talks to the Prophet ﷺ and what he tells him, he's like, what had actually happened is the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Nuqayya, had passed away right after Badr in the second year of the Hijrah. And Uthman had proposed to his other daughter, Umm Kuthum. And he told him, yes, that's a good match. And I think I would be a good match for Hafsa because she also lost her husband. So they can't tell him, oh, it's because the Prophet ﷺ himself wants to marry your daughter Hafsa. I can't expose the Prophet ﷺ's secret, but I'm not going to, so I can't say yes, but I can't say no, and I'm just left in a really weird position, because you don't get on Umar's bad side. Umar was a wrestler before Islam. Umar was a huge man. He was, he was terrifying. Like, I don't, I don't know, if Mike Tyson says, hey, jump, I would jump, because it's Mike Tyson, I am terrified of him. <laughs> Umar al was a terrifying man. And lots of people were scared of him until finally Uthman's like, look, just go talk to the Prophet ﷺ. So he talks to the Prophet ﷺ, and he tells him it's because I want to propose to Hafsa. And you can imagine the elation that Umar al is going through. He's like, oh, yes, yes, that's a good match. There is no better human being than the Prophet ﷺ. Again, Hafsa al we think of people that are like... Hafsa al was a really tough cookie. And you have to be a tough cookie to grow up in the house of Umar al-Dillah. So her and her brother, Abdullah ibn Umar, were actually also both very, they were both literate, and they were scholars of their time. So after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, during the time of Abu Bakr, they wrote down the Qur'an. It was the first original manuscript, completely compiled start to finish of the Qur'an. And this happened the year after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. After the passing of Abu Bakr al it went to the house of Umar, and after the passing of Umar, it sat in the house of Hafsa. So at some point in the history of the Ummah, the original manuscript of the Qur'an sat in her house, radiallahu anha. Subhanallah. Sayyidah Hafsa radiallahu anha, there were so many points, and again, she was one of those people that would just like, the Prophet ﷺ would say something, and she would challenge him. And she so consistently challenged him, so much so that her mother started challenging Umar. And you can imagine the first time Umar, his wife, never challenged him ever in his life. And now she's challenging him. He's like, what, what just happened? Like, just out of a lack of precedent, he's like, what just happened? She says, what, you're thinking you're better than the Prophet? Your daughter challenges the Prophet, so I said him. He's like, she does what? <laughs> he freaks out. He runs to his daughter, Hafsa. He's like, what are you, what are you doing? And she says, yeah, we all challenge him. We all talk. Like, it's a conversation back and forth. 
We all do this. There's no like I said and that's the end of it. That's just what it is. And he's like, no, 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 no. Don't don't compare yourself to Aisha. She's she's her father is better than your father. She herself is better than you. Like she's just Aisha. Just don't mess with her. Don't compare yourself to her. And she's like, no, this isn't just me. We all do this. And he's blown away by it. And he runs to the Prophet and he's like, what's going on? What's really interesting, subhanAllah, there's a point, the point where the Prophet left that month that he was gone. Umar al-Dulani goes to him. He's like, remember when we were in Mecca and the woman wouldn't talk back to us? And now we're in Medina and we can't get a word in edgewise? And the Prophet started to laugh. Medina was just a fundamentally different place. Here's a narration much, much later in the life of Umar al and this man. His wife was like giving him such a hard time. He went to complain to Umar. He's like, I don't know what to do, man. He goes to Umar, and as he's getting closer to Umar al Dulan's house, he can hear Umar's wife yelling at him. <laughs> so he leaves. He hears that, and he's like, nope. <laughs> he just starts walking back. So Umar al Dulan sees him. He's like, what do you need? And he's like, eh, no, nothing. I'm good. He's like, no, what do you want? And he tells him, he's like, I was here to complain about my wife. <laughs> Your wife was yelling at you. And he tells him, look, I did something that frustrated her. Also, do you know how much she does for me? She does this and she does that. And he starts listing everything that his wife does for him. It's like, so what if she lost her temper? It's fine. Go home to your wife. And the man goes home to his wife. SubhanAllah. I just think it's really funny because these are just normal day-to-day -day interactions and we think of them as like beyond being human. They had disagreements. SubhanAllah. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, okay, next person was Sayyida Zainab radiallahu anha. Again, she was just a, no oh shoot, bad time to have a tangent. The women of Medina, it was not part of their culture. Polygamy was not part of their culture. So the Prophet ﷺ never married a woman in Medina. Because if it's disrespectful in your culture, he just wouldn't do it. He only married women from Mecca. One, because they had migrated, because they'd left their families behind, because there was a much larger group of women than there were of men. And it was culturally acceptable for them. He would never insult anyone. So Sayyidah Zainab anha, again, her husband passed away in the third year of the Hijrah. Her husband passed away and the Prophet ﷺ married her that same year. So in that same year, the Prophet ﷺ actually ended up marrying three widows and Zainab anha, was one of them. So we actually know very little about Zainab. She ended up passing away a year after the Prophet, or a couple of months or a year after the Prophet ﷺ married her. The fact that we don't know anything about her doesn't in any way, shape or form take away from her status of being one of the mothers of the believers. If we make it our mission to do nothing but to meet her in Jannah, that's a worthwhile mission. We have this idea that if like, if you cooked some fabulous meal but it didn't end up on Instagram, did it really happen? Yes, it really happened. SubhanAllah, we don't have to know the details of everything. So that's Sayyidah Zainab radiallahu anha. The next one was Umm Salama radiallahu anha. Again, her and her husband were some of the earliest Muslims. Her actual name is Hind bint Abi Umayyah. The Prophet ﷺ married her in the fourth year of the Hijrah. Her father, her husband, sorry, her husband Abu Salama was one of the earliest Muslims and he was actually related to the Prophet ﷺ. And again, she was a single mother. She had two children. She was a widowed single mother. She had two children, Zainab and Salama, hence the name Umm Salama and Abu Salama. Abu Salama was the older son. Her daughter Zainab actually also became a scholar in her own right. So Umm Salama was a scholar and Zainab was a scholar. SubhanAllah. When Abu Salama Anha passed away, this is one really one of my favorite du'as, and it had a huge impact in my own life. When Abu Salama passed away, she went and she was just completely distraught. And the Prophet ﷺ told her, "Say this du'a." And it, what the translation of it is, "Ya Allah, protect me in this calamity and give me something that's better." She was a complete believer, so she said the du'a, and then she sat there and thought about it. She's like, "Who's better than Abu Salama?" She goes to the Prophet and she's like, who's better than Abu Salama? He was one of the very first Muslims. He did this, he did that, he did this, he did that. She's like listing everything great about her husband. And the Prophet says, well, you know, I am a prophet. <sighs> and that was his proposal to her. And she's just like, listen, 
you're great. I get really jealous. I have children. I'm old. I have a list of reasons why you should not marry me. What are you doing? Also, you're the leader of this community. Like, this is a huge responsibility. And Um Salama, the Prophet tell, Salam, tells Um Salama, he's like, it's okay. As for your children, I'll raise them like they were my own. As for your jealousy, I'll make dua that Allah help you with it. Also, I don't care how old you are. Do you know how old I am? SubhanAllah. Prophet Sallallahu married Um Salama and... Mm, oh shoot, I'm going to skip to the next person and come back to her. Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu anha. Oh shoot. Okay guys, we're not going to make it. <laughs> Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu anha. If you want to have the definition of a controversial marriage, it's her. So Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu anha was a philanthropist. She was a businesswoman. She had a lot of her own wealth which never scared the Prophet ﷺ. She was just very, very generous with her money, so much so that she was known as Umm al-Masakin, the mother of the poor. <coughs> I have this image in my head of women that go to like these galas and raise thousands of dollars for causes that wear these pearl necklaces. That's who I picture when I picture Zaynab anha. And she was originally married to Zayd ibn Haritha, the, the adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ, who later wasn't his adopted son. They, they called him the love of the Prophet ﷺ instead of the son of the Prophet ﷺ. She was married to him and it didn't work out. Because you can be two good people and just not fit. It didn't fit. They ended up getting divorced and then there was Quran that was revealed saying the Prophet ﷺ should marry her. Except he had in the Jahiliyyah before Islam announced that Zaid was his son and you're not allowed to marry the wife of your son. And even though Islam said that he wasn't technically his son, and that's not a thing anymore, that didn't stop people from making it a controversy. And Zainab radiallahu she go to the other mothers of the believers, she's like, yeah, the Qur'an was revealed telling the Prophet sallallahu to marry me. Allah decided my marriage. Take that. SubhanAllah. Just because you have a controversial marriage doesn't mean it's not going to work out. Just because other people don't approve doesn't mean it shouldn't work out. SubhanAllah. Uh, Sayyidah Juwayriya radiallahu anha, and again this was one of the paths that the Prophet ﷺ took to free people from slavery. So there was a point, there was a battle, it was the battle of Ghazud bin al-Mustalaq. And she was the daughter of the chief of the tribe. And she goes, so she's now captured, she's a prisoner of war, and she's like, what am I supposed to do? So she decides, you know what, I'm going to negotiate my way out of this. So she goes to the house of the Prophet ﷺ, she sees Aish and she tells her, look, my dad is the chief of the tribe, I need to talk to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet Aish says, I saw this beautiful woman coming to talk to the Prophet, peace be upon him, I said, nope, you don't need to talk to him at all. And she just stood in her way and she wouldn't let her. Until finally Aish, the Prophet ﷺ is like, look, who's at the door, just let them in. So this woman comes in and the Prophet ﷺ says, okay, would you accept if I married you? So the Prophet ﷺ married her and then went to everyone in Medina and said, these people are now my family. How about we free them and not keep them in captivity? How about they not be prisoners of war? Her entire tribe was freed because of her marriage to the Prophet ﷺ. Aisha said, I've never seen anyone bring more good to their people than this woman, Juwayriya Um I'm not going to get to everybody. There was Sayyidah Safiya radiallahu anha who was originally Jewish and she became converted to Islam and married the Prophet And the last one is Maymuna radiallahu anha. The Prophet married her during Umrah al-Qadha which was the seventh year, seventh year of the, Prophet, the Hijrah. The reason this is significant, two minutes, Bismillah. This is actually a good wrap up. So the reason we know how to make ghusl, so after after a woman finishes her period or after a couple is intimate, they're supposed to make ghusl, and it's the ritual bath. And we're also supposed to do this before Jummah, we're supposed to do this before the prayer of Eid. The reason we know how to do ghusl is because Maymuna radiallahu anha narrated to us how the Prophet ﷺ did ghusl. What's so significant about Ummahat al-Mu'mineen as a collective group 
the men saw who he was in the public. They saw him in his most intimate moments and narrated to us everything that he did. We wouldn't know him as a complete human being without the mothers of the believers. One. Two, there's only one Prophet But there isn't one way to be a woman. There isn't a one way to get married. There isn't one way to do anything. Out of these women, one of them was a business. There were two of them were business women. Two of them were scholars. Some of them were really, really, really strict with themselves and with others. Some of them were more relaxed. Some of them were good at cooking. Some of them had long hair. Some of them had short hair. Actually, one of them, no, no tangent, no time. <laughs> um, Salam had really long hair. There isn't one right way to be a woman. And we keep telling women, your job in the world is to get married and have children. And to nurture those children. And to put in blood, sweat, and tears into, every, into the community and to build things and to nourish things. Women are supposed to do this naturally, but so are men. The imbalance that we have in our society is actually hurting both sides of the equation. Most stars in the universe are actually two stars that rotate around each other. Do you know that game where you hold someone's hand and you go really, really, really fast in a circle? Sort of, but you're not sitting down. You're holding hands and you're going really fast. If one person lets go, the other person goes flying. That's the balance that we're supposed to have in male, of male and female in our society. If you're holding a child, the child is flying. Because the weight's not the same. So being insulting to one side of the equation or the other, it just throws society out of balance. Our goal isn't to have patriarchy or matriarchy. It's not a competition between the two. It's supposed to be a cooperation and a balance. And when we lose that balance, both sides lose out. SubhanAllah. The perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala time okay, the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He's one and not part of a pair. If you are part of a pair, then you are by definition incomplete. So just SubhanAllah. My time is up. Hopefully we'll have questions and answers later. Hopefully we cover the mothers of the believers in enough time. Again, we knew it was a tall task. Alhamdulillah. Come back after Salah, there's food and questions. <laughs> so Allah, just do a closing dua. <laughs> Sorry. Can I do a quick lo closing dua? May Allah join us with the mothers of the believers and with the Prophet ﷺ in Jannah. I mean, Allah, salli ala Muhammad wa ala sahbihi wa sallam.